the most brutal businessman of the century. From modest beginnings emerged a titan, a man whose relentless vision and ruthless ambition would carve an indelible mark on the American landscape. This is the remarkable tale of Cornelius Vanderbilt, a true rags-to-riches legend. Born into a humble Dutch settler family on May 27, 1794, on Staten Island, New York, Vanderbilt's early life was a far cry from the empire he would ultimately construct. His parents eked out a living as farmers and ferry operators, shuttling goods between Staten Island and Manhattan. It was this familial connection to the world of transportation that ignited young Cornelius's passion for the industry. Even with limited formal education, Vanderbilt's fascination with shipbuilding and design steadily grew. As a boy, he toiled alongside his father on their modest sailing vessel, absorbing the intricacies of the trade. Yet, it was his unyielding ambition that set him apart. Every penny earned while working in the family ferry business was meticulously saved. Cornelius Vanderbilt's journey from a humble ferryman's son to a transportation magnate exemplified the unbreakable spirit of a man driven by ambition and guided by unwavering determination, the unlikely titan. Cornelius Vanderbilt, a man often painted as an illiterate hothead, earned a reputation that left most he encountered either hating or fearing him. Yet paradoxically, he stands among the wealthiest individuals in history, a cunning and astute business magnate who at one point held the title of the world's richest man. When he passed away, the story goes, he possessed more wealth than the entire U.S. Treasury of his era. Before the days of Rockefeller and Henry Ford, there was Cornelius Vanderbilt, the original figure known as a robber baron, a moniker for successful industrialists who amassed colossal fortunes through cutthroat business practices. But beneath the ruthless exterior lies one of the greatest rags-to-riches stories in existence. Now, let's take a journey back to the early 1800s, where the foundation of his incredible saga was laid. The Rise of the Commodore At a mere 11 years old, Cornelius made a pivotal decision to abandon formal education and instead joined his father's ferry operation in New York Harbor. This ferry was the lifeline for transporting goods across the river, setting the stage for the remarkable journey that lay ahead. After mastering the ferry trade alongside his father, Cornelius Vanderbilt harbored an ambition to embark on his venture, doing what he knew best. To make this dream a reality, he needed a boat of his own. Now here's where it gets interesting. His mother, a farmer with limited funds but some savings tucked away, agreed to loan her son a sum of $100. This modest sum was precisely what Cornelius needed to acquire his very own small sailboat. But as the story goes, there was a catch. To secure the loan from his mother, Cornelius had to undertake a Herculean task, clearing a rocky field that she intended to cultivate as a farm. Undeterred by the daunting challenge, fueled by an unwavering work ethic, Cornelius accepted the deal. However, as he got to work, the enormity of the task became apparent. It was a colossal endeavor that would take far too long for one person. Resourceful as ever, Cornelius managed to rally local kids to assist him in the Herculean rock-removing task. He made them a promise. For their hard work, they would receive free rides on his soon-to-be-acquired boat. Together, they transformed the rugged field, earning Cornelius his dollar 100 loan from his mother. With the money in hand, Cornelius Vanderbilt, at the tender age of 16, purchased his very first boat. His journey into the world of transportation commenced as he began shuttling both passengers and freight between Staten Island and Manhattan. Competition was fierce among ship owners in the same trade, but Vanderbilt employed a shrewd strategy. He consistently undercut rivals, offering the most affordable fares in the market. Reputation for reliability and affordability soon set him apart. Importantly, he followed a simple yet potent formula. After repaying his mother's loan, every penny of profit was reinvested into his growing enterprise. This practice allowed him to rapidly expand his fleet, one boat at a time. It's a familiar capitalist blueprint for success, not too dissimilar from how Jeff Bezos built Amazon, live modestly and funnel all profits back into growth, repeating the process to construct an empire. It's similar for almost every businessman, Cornelius Vanderbilt's tireless efforts bore fruit, and soon, he commanded a fleet of ships ferrying people and goods across various routes. It was during this time that people began affectionately referring to him as the Commodore. Shrewd ventures, an unsettling personal life. As Cornelius Vanderbilt's career unfolded, a significant breakthrough came during the War of 1812 between the United States and Great Britain. 
The American government awarded him a lucrative contract to transport soldiers using his ships. This marked a pivotal moment in his burgeoning business. Remarkably, even with his relentless work hours at the tender age of 19, Cornelius managed to find time for marriage, wedded to his cousin. Together they would go on to have a staggering 13 children. Yet history paints a grim picture of Cornelius as a husband and father. Reports abound of his neglectful and unhappy family life. He even had his wife briefly committed to an insane asylum at one point. In another unsettling turn, he committed one of his sons to an asylum simply because the young boy suffered from epileptic fits, a condition Cornelius deemed a sign of weakness and mental derangement. On the business front, trade thrived, and by the late 1820s, Cornelius set his sights on elevating his enterprise to the next level, steamboats. Recognizing the superior efficiency of steamboat technology, he poured substantial investments into acquiring these vessels. Once again, he wielded the same tactics as with his sailboats, initially undercutting competitors to offer cheaper fares, thus luring away their customers. At times, he even provided free boat trips, willing to operate at a loss temporarily. Cornelius held a simple, ruthless logic. As long as he had more capital than his competitors, he could swiftly bankrupt them by siphoning off their clientele. Once they crumbled, he could raise his prices to sustainable levels. This predatory strategy indeed led to the bankruptcy of several business owners. In many instances, Cornelius didn't stop at bankruptcy. He bought out competitors' businesses at reduced rates when they realized they couldn't compete with his pricing. Some larger steamboat companies took a different approach and paid Cornelius substantial sums to vacate their territories and refrain from competing on the same trade routes. For example, when he entered the Hudson River scene, the Steamboat Association paid him a staggering $100,000 to cease operations in their territory. For them, it was a more economical option than contending with his cutthroat pricing. Despite his burgeoning wealth, Cornelius remained an outsider among the elite. His limited formal education was a disadvantage, manifesting in his struggles with writing and speaking, setting him apart from the upper class. However, he skillfully leveraged his working class origins to his advantage, marketing his ships as the people's line, making travel affordable for everyday individuals. Yet, Cornelius's thirst for wealth and power was insatiable. In 1849, he identified his next lucrative opportunity, the California Gold Rush, the California Gold Rush Bonanza. When gold was discovered in California, it triggered a stampede of hundreds of thousands of fortune seekers, marking the largest mass migration in American history. California was not yet connected to the rest of the country by rail, and this presented an opportunity that Cornelius Vanderbilt was quick to seize. He launched boat trips to California, aiming to capitalize on this gold rush frenzy. While others also ventured into this lucrative business, Cornelius set himself apart by devising a novel route to California via Nicaragua, shaving about 600 miles off the journey compared to the Panama route favored by most. Through an exclusive agreement with the government of Nicaragua, Cornelius's voyages became faster and more affordable than the competition, attracting a flood of customers. As the rush to California intensified, it was Cornelius who reaped the rewards of every voyage. But in a rare departure from his relentless work ethic, in 1853, as he approached his 60th birthday, Cornelius decided to take a vacation. He purchased a colossal yacht and embarked on a European tour with his family. Little did he know that this respite would become a pivotal turning point in his life. He entrusted the management of his transport business in Nicaragua to two associates, Morgan and Garrison, only to discover that they had struck a shady deal with the new president of Nicaragua, William Walker, who had forcibly taken control of the country. The deal effectively stripped Cornelius of his exclusive operating rights in the country, handing them to Morgan and Garrison. Cornelius's response was swift and decisive. In a terse letter to the two men, he ominously declared, Gentlemen, you have undertaken to cheat me. I won't sue you for the law is too slow. I'll ruin you. Yours truly, Cornelius Vanderbilt. And that's precisely what he did. Cornelius promptly established another transit company nearby, luring customers with irresistibly low prices. He implemented a transport blockade to and from Nicaragua, sought to rally neighboring countries against Walker's government, and eventually played a role in instigating a war that toppled the new regime. True to his word, Cornelius Vanderbilt had ruthlessly dismantled those who had crossed him. The final act of Cornelius Vanderbilt. In the twilight of his remarkable life, 
Cornelius Vanderbilt began to redirect a portion of his immense wealth toward philanthropy. A standout example of his generosity was the establishment of Vanderbilt University, backed by a million-dollar endowment. At the time, this monumental gift stood as the largest charitable contribution in American history. However, these benevolent endeavors coincided with Cornelius's declining health, rendering him bedridden. Despite his physical frailty, his fiery and aggressive spirit remained unquenched. An illustrative incident unfolded when members of the media gathered outside his residence to report on his illness. In a characteristic display of vigor, he had to be physically restrained after venturing outside to confront them. After several months of battling illness, Cornelius Vanderbilt passed away in 1877 at the age of 82. The New York Times reported his death, attributing it to exhaustion, stemming from the prolonged struggle against a constellation of chronic ailments. At the time of his demise, his fortune was valued at around $100 million, a staggering sum. When adjusted for inflation, this would equate to approximately $200 billion in today's currency. Astonishingly, on paper, he held roughly one-ninth of all the American currency in circulation at that time for an even more extraordinary tale of wealth, like and subscribe, then click on the video link provided where you'll discover more about wealthy people and how they live.